Okay. Aloha. And good morning. And uh, I'm sorry I'm a couple of minutes late. I know your time is very valuable, and I appreciate you, you standing by. Um, it's always great to have an opportunity and sit down to talk with you and about what's going on in the, in the Pacific or in the Indo-Asia Pacific, my particular area of responsibility. Um, it's been a while since I've been here in Washington, and a lot has happened uh, during that time. Uh, we assisted the Philippine government as they dealt with the aftermath of a super typhoon. Uh, the Operation Damian and the Joint Task Force that was led by Lieutenant General Whistler, uh, they did an excellent job. Uh, it was a multinational operation, uh, and there was a quick transition in that operation to the Armed Forces of the Philippines and ultimately to the government of the Philippines to be able to, to, to continue that, uh, that recovery. But uh, the effort was, I think, quite successful, and it demonstrates uh, the overall value of working together on HADR-related training and initiatives so that we can respond more quickly and more effectively in these type of things and types of events. And I think it, it paid uh, big dividends to things we've been doing in, the, in this AOR. Um, as you know, about 80%, uh, about I'm told, of all natural disasters happen within the area of responsibility that, that I look at every day. So being able to respond that, that in that way was a, a good sign, I think, of of our alliances, of our partnerships, and the multilateral uh, training that we're doing together. I also traveled to Thailand and to Vietnam. Uh, we've all been seeing the political unrest in Thailand. Uh, but it's important, I think, to highlight that the Thai military uh, has responded uh, favorably in support of their government, uh, a democracy that's working through these challenges. Uh, my time talking with both the government and the military leadership uh, highlighted their uh, efforts to uh, to maintain a peaceful, democratic processes, and we hope them all the best. Uh, the trip to Vietnam marked the first time that a PACOM commander has visited there since both of our nation's presidents signed the Comprehensive Partnership here in D.C. in July of 2012. And we're working closely with the Vietnamese military, and we're looking for opportunities to expand and grow our partnerships and work together, especially when it comes to humanitarian and disaster relief operations. Uh, it was clear to me that, uh, that uh, despite the, uh, our histories uh, as two countries that we share together, uh, that we sh today, in today's world, we share many common interests. And maintaining peace and security in the region is uh, foremost in their minds as well as in ours. Uh, in fact, the uh, second uh, PACOM-sponsored disaster management center uh, opened Vietnam while I was traveling in country, which is indicative of the type of things that we're doing together. And finally, uh, before I take your questions, I'd like to mention my remarks to the Navy Surface Warrior uh, Convention, the SNA convention that I spoke at uh, last week. Uh, as you may or may not know, I'm a surface uh, warrior as well. Uh, I have uh, many years of experience in almost every location around the globe. Uh, so it's important to me that at forums such as that, that uh, I address the Navy's future surface warrior leaders, uh, hear them and understand uh, what their concerns are, as well as industry uh, that supports them. Because they will ultimately have to buy, man, train, and equip not only the current force we have, but the force of the future. And they have to be ready to address the growing challenges that they will likely face across the entire Indo-Asia Pacific uh, and the world. Um, the comments I made were not about America's rebalance to the Asia Pacific because that is well on track. Uh, we're making the progress and from the PACOM commander's perspective, uh, we are doing the things that we have committed and said we would do to the rebalance. But my comments were about the growing sophistication and the capabilities uh, of today's weapon systems uh, and our changing relative dominance uh, with those systems. The rapid technological advancement of warfare capabilities and the proliferation of these capabilities across the globe will challenge us in the future, and we have to continue to address that. We must also ensure that we invest in the proper mix of defensive and offensive capabilities for our ships, and that's who I was talking to, or 
people that man and equip ships, uh, and that the capabilities that they have are both lethal and dominant when required, and they must continue to strive for that. So with that, I'll stop and uh, take your questions. Uh, I'm associate Press. Bill, you want to start us off? Sure. I'm mean, getting to that last point that you made. So you do not think that the U.S. is losing seeding ground or losing ground in, in its dominance in the Pacific to China. And can you speak a bit about your your comments on weapon systems? What weapon systems do you think that China is mo is developing more quickly than the United States uh, at this point? Well, China is only one uh, weapon developer in the world. There's many weapons developers. In fact, I've said over time that the Indo-Asia Pacific is the most militarized region in the world. Uh, and where uh, there are, uh, because of growth of, of, of economies, because of they have money to invest, because of in growing uh, defense uh, uh, requirements by countries, they are all, in many ways, pursuing uh, uh, the militarization. I mean, they're buying weapons, and they're buying 21st century weapons. Uh, they are not the, the same weapons uh, systems that we dealt with 30 years ago. They are, they're, they're in this age. Uh, and so when we talk about uh, U.S. relative dominance, uh, uh, maybe the, uh, the right way to look at this would be uh, after World War II, throughout most of the world, uh, we built a, a U.S. military that was uh, unequaled uh, in technology. And over time, uh, we've contributed our own selves to the development of militaries and development of defense capabilities for peaceful purposes. And we have... Uh, move those technologies to other partners and to allies. And so uh, uh, it only stands to reason that, uh, that our relative uh, dominance in those technologies and those weapon systems will have diminished over time. Uh, that's not something to be afraid of, it's just to be pragmatic about it. And so as we look forward to a world that, um, that will have continue to have defense challenges and we continue to buy, build, and procure systems, we have to think carefully about uh, the, the types of systems and where we make the most investments so that we maintain the type of um, um, edge that, that military leadership have uh, in this country have enjoyed for the last few decades. So it's not just about any one particular country. Uh, uh, Admiral, I wonder if you could take us back to that incident between the Calpens and the Chinese ship, you know, I don't know how long ago it was, weeks ago. Tell us exactly what happened there. You know, how dangerous was that situation? Now, are we likely to see more situations like that as tensions increase in the East China, South China Sea, between China and the U.S., and also Japan? Yes. Well, the, the incident was r widely reported, um, and I think that um, it was commented on by, by the leadership here in the Pentagon as, as well as by me. Uh, and in fact, uh, there was a demarche that was sent, uh, that we sent uh, uh, formally to, to and, and the demarches are, are, those are not, uh, th those are j fairly routine globally when we want to, to communicate to someone that we've been really uh, concerned about something that has, that was, has happened. So in this case, um, there was an, an interaction in the international waters, in uh, international airspace uh, that we, uh, routinely operate in, and that the uh, uh, Chinese were conducting uh, what they uh, claimed to be uh, carrier operations that they believe had been properly notified. Um, those notification procedures uh, were in question, um, and the, I, I don't think the, that the people that were on the cowpens, in fact, I'm sure, were not aware of any notification of that. At any point in time, was the situation dangerous? I wasn't on the bridge of the ship, so I can't tell you how the CO felt about it. I would probably characterize it as more as uh, unnecessary uh, and probably more an unprofessional. Uh, and that, uh, but we have to, to understand, I think, as we look at this part of the world and we look at the growing number of, of navies that are operating and the no growing number of security concerns that are in this region, we have to expect that militaries are going to have to encounter and operate with each, around each other. And in this case, uh, we have to expect that the U.S. and the Chinese navies are going to interact with each other. So this just highlights to both of us, to both the PL PLA and to the U.S. military, that we have to do better at being able to communicate with each other in a, in a, in a way that allows us to not lead to miscalculation that won't be productive in the security environment. 
And so we will continue to talk about this. In fact, we're having, we've had defense officials in Beijing t the last two days, and I'm sure that they have talked about this. We have a mechanism in place with the Chinese where we meet uh, routinely to talk about maritime uh, incidences, how we interact with each other. So uh, will we see more of these in the future? Uh, we will interact with more, more with each other in the future. My hope is that we will learn to interact, uh, continue to learn, and to progress in the professionalism that we exhibit towards each other. This is the best way forward. You say unprofessional. Do you mean unprofessional on the part of that Chinese skipper, or just a general sense of, uh, you know, unprofessionalness on the part of the Chinese Navy? Well, I don't know if it's it, unprofessional or whether it was um, um, lack of experience. I mean, one of the things that I were, that I told my uh, my leadership and my sea captains is that, uh, you know, when we're operating in this area, I mean, first we're, we talk to each other on bridge to bridge telephone, right? right? Radio telephones to to work this out, and we speak in English, and uh, other countries don't. They speak, they're speaking, or they speak in English, but they're not speaking in their native language, and so there's a, an extra calculation you have to figure into what someone's trying to tell you when they're speaking the second or third language that they speak, and you're speaking in your primary language, and so we have to take this into consideration to make sure that we have that we have uh, looked at all aspects of this. Um, in the end, uh, the U.S. military, my forces in, in the Pacific AOR will operate freely in international waters, international airspace. That's the bottom line. We'll, we'll operate there. We'll operate professionally, and we'll, we will operate peacefully for the purpose of peace. And that's the message to all the militaries that are operating in that region. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, India is going for a massive modernization effort for its armed forces. One of the complaints which I hear from the Indian defense expert is that U.S. is not willing to share one of the latest technologies, equipments which India wants for defending its country, uh, defending its borders. Uh, do you have to say anything, anything on it? And where do you see India's role in your Asia-Pacific rebalance strategy? Well, if you go back to uh, the uh, defense guidance or the strategy that was signed out by President Obama, uh, one of the things that I'm directed to do is, as the U.S. government is, but and on the military side, is to develop a long-term uh, strategic relationship with India. And we're moving in that direction. And one of the cornerstones of that long-term key relationship is to learn how we learn how we go forward, or to go to figure out how we go forward uh, in uh, many of our procurement areas. Uh, where we share a similar interest and we share similar uh, capabilities. How do we partner together in those? Um, the systems are different. And uh, the Indian government and the military recognize that their procurement system is different than our procurement system. Uh, and that we're working through how to streamline those uh, differences or to, to make those differences not uh, so apparent so that we can move forward with some of the key technologies and key of capabilities that we want to develop. Um, and so I think the road ahead is a good road. I think we have a plan, but it will take time. And the other second part, uh, what role do you see for India's in the rebalance strategy? Well, I think in the long run, um, certainly the, the, uh, the, Indi the Indian Ocean and India's role in security in the peaceful Indian Ocean is critical. Um, and we welcome that role. And so uh, to the degree that uh, India chooses to, uh, to take on that role and to participate uh, with us and with other partners uh, 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 in global security uh, with a, a central focus on the Indian Ocean, this is a good thing. Admiral, I have a question with regard to those sailors who participated in the disaster relief operation off the coast of Japan three years ago. The Congress directed DOD to conduct a research um, about a possible you know, radiation dose for those sailors. Do you have any specific plan how to conduct this uh, research yet? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to have to refer you to the Department of the Navy for that. Uh, even though I'm sitting here as an admiral and these forces were uh, in the command of PACOM at that time, uh, that the we're, we're the, as they're looking at this issue, I would refer you to the Department of the Navy. I think they have an ongoing investigation to look at uh, what are the 
uh, what are the, the things that need to be looked at uh, with a timeline of how you, how you get to resolution. But my guess is that they'll give you an answer that tells you they have a plan and that, uh, that they're in execution to look at it. Uh, let's go to Paul. Admiral uh, Paul Schaefer, U.S. News & World Report. Going back to China for a second, about a year ago, in the wake of China uh, testing their new aircraft carrier, you had said that you didn't fault the Chinese Navy for expanding, but that it was their responsibility to fit into the global security environment. Um, with all that's happened in China this past year, I wonder if you can give us an update on, on how you feel about their behavior and whether they're on, on, on path to, uh, to actually fit into that. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, uh, as I look globally at China, I think there are uh, some positive aspects of the, how they're um, using their military forces in a, in a productive way. They participated in Operation Damian in the Philippines. Uh, they provided disaster relief. They're uh, are operating, I think, more frequently in multilateral exercises that are being done throughout the region. And as we've talked about, they're going to planning to come to RIMPAC, so that's still well on track. If you go into uh, the Gulf of Aden, they're operating further away from home and, and uh, participating in the security in, in those particular regions. So I think in, in that context, uh, and, and oh, by the way, our relationship, I think our bilateral relationship uh, has been, uh, a, a, I would give it a, a passing grade uh, for the last year. And I would say that because we have been able to continue our mill-to-mill -mill dialogue, our mill-to-mill -mill relationships, and our mill-to-mill uh, work, you know, mill-to-mill -mill exercises together, uh, even though there has been churn in the region, particularly in the, the local region that's, uh, n that's close, to, uh, close to China. Now, in regard to um, their activities in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, I think it's yet to be determined about uh, what, how, how, that will, how that will play out. Um, you know, ultimately, China needs to be a regional leader. Uh, their military needs to be a regional leader. Uh, it needs to coexist in uh, that part of the world with our allies and with our militaries. Uh, and we need to work together for the mutual security. Um, but uh, I think they're going to have to work uh, hard to, to, um, uh, to get through some of the issues, the territorial disputes they're having uh, with their neighbors. And, you know, we don't take sides on the territorial disputes, but we do expect them to be done peacefully. And I think they have to think carefully uh, uh, about, uh, you know, the introduction of things like ADISs, uh, like they did in the past, uh, and, uh, and how, how they go forward with that in the future, and to be uh, uh, open and have a dialogue with people before they do it. Thank you very much. Um, I have two questions. Uh, in next month, the United States and South Korea will take a drill for the key reserve uh, military exercises. North Korea has been asked for the, this exercise to stop. What is the United States position about that? Well, we don't plan to stop uh, the exercises. Um, the exercises are part of the alliance, a cornerstone of how we train and maintain the alliance. So as long as the, the people and the government of South Korea and the people and the government of the United States of America want this alliance and there's a threat that we that we that appears to to continue in North Korea, uh, then this exercises will go on. Uh, it shouldn't be alarming. It's not a change. We do these every year, uh, and we're going to continue to do them uh, as long as uh, the risk on the Korea Peninsula persists. One more question: The sudden change in North Korea, uh, South Korea, and the United States have any uh, specific uh, plan to do have? I didn't understand the question. Sudden change in North Korea, in, in case of a sudden change in North well, Korea. In case of a sudden change? Yes, you know, we, we've been doing, uh, as you know, when uh, the, uh, uh, the officials in, in South Korea will tell you the same, is that we do, have to, as an alliance, have done for years um, detailed planning for many different types of scenarios of what might unfold on the Korea Peninsula. Uh, and one of those would be a rapidly changing situation uh, that um, would require a stabilization of, of the peninsula. So that planning is ongoing. Uh, it will continue to be refined on this year and next year, and as long as the possibility for, for, um, um, uh, uh, for provocation or, pro or possibility for war on the peninsula exists. 
Louis. Sir, on the rebalance to, to Asia, um, do you foresee any new deployments uh, that would underwrite that strategy? Uh, what we seem to have seen uh, really is uh, the replacement or the, ro the rotation of, of assets with the same capabilities thus far. Anything new in mind? Yes. Well, I mean, I think if you um, if you kind of start from the top of the of the Asia Northeast Asia, uh, first this year the Japanese and the U.S. will look at the defense re a defense review, which is which hasn't been done since the 90s, and we will look at uh, the uh, what that means for the alliance of the future and what the laydown of forces should be. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the second thing in, is that we have a, appear to be moving in a positive direction on the Fatima replacement facility in Okinawa, uh, where the landfill was signed, and we very much appreciate the support of the Japanese government in moving that forward. And that will, once that happens and that facility is built, uh, that will allow us then the realignment of the Marine forces throughout the Asia Pacific in accordance with the what you would refer to as a DPRI plan that has been briefed to you all, I think, widely. It would allow them some to relocate to Guam and ultimately some to relocate to Hawaii. Uh, and then there's the initiative with the Marines and the Air Force uh, that we are pursuing uh, with our uh, Australian partners as well. So that's kind of on the, uh, the land domain. Uh, we're also looking at the infrastructure uh, that we have uh, together with our allies over, uh, over uh, to in, in each of our uh, alliance countries to ensure that, that our shared uh, infrastructure or the infrastructure that they have and that we would partner with them to use uh, is set for the 21st century. So <clears throat> on top of that, we have um, uh, the additional deployment of um, of LCSs. Uh, the first one that we sent, I think, kind of on an early timeline, has finished, and that deployment has been, uh, I think, overall successful. And that will follow in the number of months once the LCSs are in place into uh, de uh, deployments of up to three or four out of Singapore at any particular time. So these are just kind of on the periphery. We're also, I've also asked each of the services to go look at uh, each of my components, service components to look at how do you maximize the force that we have in being today as it rebalances to the Asia Pacific. So we have initiatives in, in the Marine Corps, we have initiatives in the Navy, which means LCSs and additional submarines, and I think that long term we would be looking at the possibility of, of foreign deploying more maritime assets uh, throughout the theater. Uh, well, the Army, which is kind of new to the, new to this, uh, to the Asia Pacific in the last couple of decades, uh, is, uh, is looking at uh, uh, opportunities of how do you take an army that is coming after out of uh, Afghanistan and, and has been in coin operations for the last uh, uh, basically two, two decades and to put them um, in the Asia Pacific in a meaningful way that allows them to partner with our allies and with our, our, our partners and, and our growing strategic partners uh, in a meaningful way and how them, have them available for crisis response if necessary. So there's concepts like Pacific Pathways that are being talked about. Uh, there are concepts at this point in time, but overall I'm supportive of these initiatives. So we have a lot going on. Um, we've also looked at the, around the edges of things that we do that maybe don't get quite so much splash, but we've looked at maybe realigning some resources to the uh, Asia Pacific Center, uh, which is a, uh, a great venue for us to bring in our partners and our allies military and civilian leadership to talk about our shared uh, security interests. So that's, that's kind of a, a, a nutshell, a few things we're doing, but, but uh, the plan is, uh, is on course. Yeah, just uh, on two, two fronts, uh, on the, in the Korean Peninsula, what was behind the decision to increase the number of forces there uh, with that armored unit? And then I have a question about the East China Sea. Yeah. Well, the decision to, to do the uh, rotational armor unit there was, uh, was not prompted by any particular change in the, uh, in the tactical or strategic environment on the peninsula. It was looked at from a, uh, from a component, army component perspective, is how do you best maintain the capability on the peninsula uh, in, the, in the century we're, we're in with the resources that we have. 
uh, in a way that would be most effective support for General Scaparotti and his and the and his CFC team there. Uh, so um, it got played out like it was a big strategic move, but in reality, it was just part of the pre-planned decision we'd made in the alliance to make sure we had the most capable forces on the peninsula in the way that were reflective of the way we rotate. We're increasingly rotating and using forces in this century. And then on the East China Sea, how would you assess the current state of tensions between Japan and China, and how, how much of a risk is there that a miscalculation or some kind of incident could trigger a conflict? Well, I am concerned. Uh, I would say that uh, I think there is uh, any time you have uh, two large powers, two large economic powers, two large military powers, that uh, have a disagreement that they're not talking to each other about, uh, that has no uh, clear um, diplomatic end state in sight, uh, that the risk of calculation uh, can grow because you will have, uh, in this case, you have primarily maritime security forces that are in and around those contested islands. Uh, but those are, uh, you know, in many cases, those are young. Uh, you know, young naval officers or young civilian mariners who are out there going to make in, making those decisions. So we have to continue to encourage uh, restraint. We have to continue to encourage professionalism. Um, and uh, we have to continue to hope that there will be uh, diplomatic dialogue and a solution to this because it, it's not productive for the region uh, and it, uh, it needs to be ultimately resolved. Yes, sir. Thank you. A uh, follow-up question about the uh, East China Sea. Have you talked to your Chinese counterpart about the ADIZ? How did they respond? Did you send another round of military flights to <coughs> this area? Thank you. Yeah, the question of where we have we talked to the Chinese about the ADIZ, the answer to that is uh, yes. Um, the question is, did we know about it before they uh, established it? Uh, were not directly notified. Um, and, um, you know, we certainly were not, uh, the fact that they established an aid is, I think, is less concern to me than the way that it was done. Uh, it would have been better if it had been uh, announced and had been discussed with the, with the neighbors and with the partners in the region. Uh, and it had some caveats inside of the way they established that we fundamentally don't agree with and, and will not acknowledge. So our operations have not changed, uh, and we uh, will continue to operate in international airspace and do our operations just as we do around anywhere, everywhere else in the world, not just in this part of the world. Uh, Admiral Colin Clark, Breaking Defense. Um, did the Chinese test a hypersonic uh, vehicle, and how would you assess the strategic uh, impact of such a test? Well, I didn't see the test, but I'm uh, told, told that they tested it, and you all reported it pretty widely, so I believe there's uh, credibility in your reporting. Um, the Chinese, as other nations are, are pursuing hyper, uh, hyper glide, hypersonic technologies. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so I'm, the fact that they're testing, I think this is just one of many, uh, as I talked about earlier in my remarks, this is just one of many uh, uh, you know, highly technical, militarized systems that uh, that uh, whether the Chinese are developing or we're developing them or Euro Europeans are developing, that will continue to complicate the security environment with high technology systems, uh, and we will have to to uh, figure them into the calculation of how we're going to maintain a peaceful security environment in the future. I think we have time for one more question, sir. Hi, uh, Bhagam Rani from Defense News. Good to see you again, sir. Um, Two-part two question. First, are, are you convinced that the Chinese, in the event of an incident, whether it's an incident between Japan and China, for example, or, or, or between us in the future, Kalpin's incident that ends up somewhat more sporty, that they're actually going to answer the phone and they have the crisis response mechanisms in place? Because one of your predecessors going back about 12 years ago found nobody was really answering the telephone when mm -hmm. something really bad happened. And I have one follow-up question after that. Yeah. Well, I think you'd have to ask the, the Chinese and the PRC if they're going to answer the phone or not. Um, and uh, well, what do you call? Do they answer the phone now? And yeah, I, I would say that we that that 
both in the region and, and in our mill-to-mill -mill relationship that we need to move um, forward uh, to, to allow that type of, of direct dialogue in crisis situations. We've uh, said this on many occasions. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Chairman Dempsey, uh, Secretary uh, Hagel, and at that level that there are uh, an occasional uh, an attempt and opportunities to have dialogue at, at that level. And uh, would that work at the time of a crisis? We would hope it would work. Uh, but internal to the PACOM AOR, uh, I don't uh, have the ability to pick up the phone and talk directly to a, um, a PLA um, or PLA Navy Admiral or General at the time of a crisis. And we need to work on that. So we've talked about it. Uh, but things take time. The other question is, do we, it seems as though we repeatedly are surprised when things like the ADAS happens. Are we, on our part and with our allies, doing enough to imagine what next is coming out of Beijing and figure where we need to be collectively so that it's a little bit more of a joined up response because there has been a little bit of criticism in how the response was. Are we doing enough to think ahead as to what, frankly, if you look out there, Beijing is fairly logically and consistently mm -hmm. trying to achieve over the long term? Well, I guess if we keep getting surprised, we're probably not doing enough. But uh, we're working at it. Uh, I don't think we were necessarily surprised by the ideas as you. I think that's a mischaracterization. I think we anticipated that there could have been that, that I mean that there were some signals, at least in some open press, that there might have been an opportunity uh, for an ADIS, ADIS to be established. I think we were a little bit surprised by the, the way it was announced and the, the manner it was, you know, how fast it was sprung on the, sprung on the, uh, the region. Uh, and the, the, the fact that it was an ADIS that just kind of was directed at one central issue, not just the general uh, defense of a, someone's territorial airspace. Sir, I think we reached our, our time limit. Unless you want to take one more. I'll take one more since I was late. That's uh, Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, you saw last week the, uh, you were so worried about the uh, North Korea and their unexpected behavior. So how do you evaluate the, uh, their WMD capability and their young leader? Yeah. Well, I think that uh, the young leader is, is, is uh, for me, is very difficult to determine. Um, in fact, unpredictable, I believe, is the best, uh, best way I would say it. Um, I think that his behavior uh, at least the way it's reported and the way we the way we see it in senses um, makes me makes you would make me wonder whether or not um, um, he is always in the rational decision making mode or not and, and this is a problem uh, is a problem because of the the um, uh, continued nuclearization of the country the con continued pursuit of missile technologies which uh, threaten not only uh, the peninsula, but threaten the region, and eventually now will threaten the globe if if it's not constrained. So, uh, in the end, we must demand the total denuclearization of North Korea. Uh, it's in the interest of not only uh, South Korea and the United States, but of all the people in the region, uh, and now it's in the best interest of everybody in the world. So, um, the way ahead with uh, with the new leader there is not clear to me, but I think that. Uh, uh, it, it is uh, a potentially very dangerous place. Thank you very much.